All right, so this is the next case. This was a case two here was a, um, um, a face nodule. They thought it was a cyst also. Uh, and it was on, I think, the chin um, or thereabouts of a 60-year-old man, uh, skin colored. And we can see, uh, unfortunately, I apologize for the fragmented nature of the specimen, but I think you'll understand a little bit more of why that happened in a minute here. We do have a tiny bit of skin, which is unremarkable. And then underneath that, we've got some you know, fibroblast-like, scar-like uh, granulation tissue type areas almost, some dense sclerotic collagen or something dense and eosinophilic with little bits of purple calcification inside. So this actually isn't, even though yes, it is collagen that's dense, actually looks, once we see that the dense sclerotic collagen is starting to mineralize and pick up calcium, it looks like this is actually irregular bone formation or osteoid. Other areas are quite blue. And oops, sorry, I didn't mean to zoom so fast. You can see actually there are lacunar spaces and uh, this is a cellular, a hypercellular atypical chondrocytes here. So very concerning. You do have to be careful. You can get a hypercellularity and pretty bizarre looking uh, nuclear change in reactive cartilage, but, uh, but uh, you always have to think about, you know, it could be malignant. And to my eye as a soft tissue pathologist, this looks very concerning for chondrosarcoma right here. Not something we often see in the skin. And then it also turns into areas that make uh, sclerotic, dense collagen that's picking up mineral. So to me, this looks like irregular osteoid deposition. So this looks like osteosarcoma here. So I feel like we got areas that look like chondrosarcoma, areas like osteosarcoma. And then somewhere in here, I was going to show you there's a, maybe it's on this slide. Yeah. Right in here in the middle, you can really see the bone formation is more believable. It really is converting into bone. And in the midst of the bone, we have scattered cells that are hyperchromatic and atypical. Maybe it was this piece here. Well, somewhere around here, there was a, a mitosis and an atypical hyperchromatic nucleus. Like there, that'll do. This hyperchromatic atypical nucleus. So to me, this looks like uh, if you just had the cartilage, you could think of chondrosarcoma. But here with cartilage and bone together, both atypical, if this were in a long bone, I would, in the right radiographic context, I'd say it's a chondroblastic osteosarcoma. But what is it doing in the skin? As far as, we, um, as far as I can recall, there was no connection with the underlying bone. This was a nodule in the subcutis and dermis. Well, let's look out at the periphery and see what's going on here. Around the outside of this nodule of atypical cartilage and osteoid, we've got a proliferation, a sheet-like proliferation of atypical oval to spindle cells. And unfortunately, this, this uh, H&E from this recut stained uh, pretty intensely and in, in, uh, overly hematoxylin, uh, unfortunately. So I apologize that the scan is not very clear out here, but for, for ultra rare things, we just got to be satisfied with the best that we've got sometimes. And so uh, there, here we've got sheets of really markedly atypical hyperchromatic spindle to oval cells in diffuse sheets. And I don't know if you can pick up on them, but there are lots of mitotic figures, mitoses all over the place. So we have what looks like a high grade spindle cell tumor, like a sarcoma with a lot of mito mitotic activity. So I did my usual panel. If I recall correctly, I did a keratin, SOX10. Um, I probably did a, a P40 or P63 as well for like a poorly differentiated squamous cell carcinoma uh, with, you know, uh, hetero, heterologous um, uh, bone and cartilage, um, osteosarcomatous and chondrosarcomatous differentiation. And um, I can't remember what else I did. But what matters is uh, the keratin and uh, P63 were negative. And this here is SOX10. So I, my interpretation is that this is a spindle cell melanoma with uh, extensive heterologous, um, chondrosarcomatous, and osteosarcomatous differentiation. Some people in the past have, have used the term matrix producing melanoma because it's a melanoma that's making like a, a bone and cartilage matrix material. So I've, I read about this long ago when I was a trainee and I always thought the idea sounded so wild and crazy. And to my uh, recollection, sorry, I keep uh, tapping the mouse pad wrong on this MacBook. 
Um, that's why that box keeps popping up. To my recollection, this is the only example that I have seen uh, in 10 years of practice. So it's quite a rare bird, so to speak. And this is that area I showed you at the beginning that looked kind of, uh, you know, mixoidy, almost granulation tissue or scar-like. And you can see little trickling spindled melanocytes. I would make an argument that this probably kind of falls into the spectrum of desmoplastic melanoma component here, with the rest being cellular spindle cell melanoma component. Uh, no in situ component present on the, the tiny little bit of epidermis we have, but that's also not terribly surprising because we do see spindle cell and desmoplastic melanomas quite frequently that don't have a melanoma in situ component with them, particularly if you're a soft tissue pathologist and you see consults, you tend to see more of those because uh, people tend to send those in thinking that they're a sarcoma of some sort. And um, the bone and cartilage component have uh, no expression, uh, no significant expression of socks in the center there. You can see that it kind of fades out. So uh, I would interpret this as being a basically de-differentiation. And melanomas, we know, sometimes lose expression, particularly ugly spindle cell ones, lose expression of their uh, normal markers, including sometimes even partially SOX10 and S100. Uh, but definitely, I commonly see spindle cell melanoma with complete loss of MART1 and HMB45. But I even sometimes see them with loss of these markers. I have seen another melanoma uh, with a heterologous um, rhabdomyosarcomatous component, another extremely rare situation where there was um, over time as the melanoma, in that case it was a metastatic melanoma, and it had zones with loss of all the melanocytic markers that began to produce striated rhabdomyoblasts and had desmin and myogenin expression uh, in unbelievable uh, case, which I will have to make sure to post. We just published that uh, a year or so ago, and I'll have to make sure to post the digital slides here on Kiko sometime in the near future. It's on my to-do list because it's such a dramatic case. So what's amazing to me is other sarcomas do this uh, this thing where they de-differentiate, lose their expression of their normal markers or lose their their um, uh, microscopic differentiation, and then re-differentiate along different lines. Uh, De-differentiated liposarcoma, for example, is relatively common among sarcomas, loses its fattiness, looks like a high-grade undifferentiated sarcoma, and then has a, a strong tendency to produce osteosarc, chondrosarc, limosarc, and any sort of other type of line of differentiation. We see the, th the same thing in malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumors, which um, are also of a neural crest origin, just like melanomas, and they relatively often uh, uh, begin to lose expression of neural markers. In fact, most of them lose expression of S100 and SOX10, partially or completely, and then a significant subset will show a, a heterologous differentiation into rhabdomyosarcoma components. So what blows my mind is why don't melanomas do this more often? They they come from neural crest. They're much more common than a lot of those sarcomas. And yet it's extremely rare to see this phenomenon, in my experience at least, in a melanoma. So I don't know the answer to that question, but it's always really intrigued me um, anytime I see melanoma doing something weird like this because it can do so many other things and yet doing this is extremely uncommon. So I will uh, go back to give you one last view um, of, the, of the bone and cartilage areas. So my recommendation would be if you think you see um, chondrosarcoma and osteosarcoma in the skin, number one, always ask yourself, could it be reactive? Because reactive bone and cartilage can be quite wild, especially on the digits, the fingers. You can have things like Nora's lesion, bizarre pyrosteal, osteochondromatous proliferation, BPOP, that's, that's why we call it Nora's lesion because it's such a long name. And by the way, I actually worked with Dr. Nora, the Nora of Nora's lesion, when I was a teenager working in a private practice pathology lab in Florida. And he was such a cool, fun guy. And only years later after my fellowship did I realize that that was the Nora of Nora's lesion. And uh, so there's my little fun story about that. And there are other things like fibrosis, pseudotumor of the digit, and things like that that can look quite scary and bone and cartilage. So uh, for any derm paths here that don't see a lot of bone and soft tissue, uh, that that would just be one consideration is make sure you're not missing one of those benign things mimicking malignancy. And then also, if you see what looks like chondrosarcoma or osteosarcoma in the skin, think about melanoma or more likely carcinoma like basal cell or even, I don't think I've ever seen a squamous cell with chondro chondrosarcomatous or osteosarc component, but I've definitely seen a couple basal cells. Basal cells, for some strange reason, when they become sarcomatous, they, uh, when they become like a carcinosarcoma, they like to make uh, uh, osteosarcoma component. 
Um, I've seen that several times actually. So those are all the things I would consider if you see that. And then of course, lastly, think about could this patient actually have a underlying chondrosarcoma or osteosarcoma growing up into the skin directly from direct extension. I've seen that like one time in a recurrent osteosarcoma that penetrated the skin overlying the bone on the leg. But I mean, we knew what the diagnosis was there because this patient had already had a, a diagnosis had been treated multiple times, unfortunately. Uh, failed treatment and lost their limb. Um, and then a metastatic chondrosarcoma or osteosarcoma, which I don't recall that I have ever seen in the skin uh, personally, uh, not to my recollection. And I've seen a fair number of chondrosarcomas and osteosarcomas, just not metastatic to the skin. So I'm sure it's out there and it happens, but it's rare. So that may be a longer di differential discussion than, than you were uh, planning on. But as you know, I, I go off on, uh, on rabbit trails and uh, and get distracted a lot. So uh, this case is particularly fascinating. I hope you enjoyed it. Okay, let's go on to...